At issue this Sunday, we're on to South Carolina, but we're going to take a look back at the New Hampshire primary. Donald Trump wins big, while Nikki Haley vows to press on. And President Biden is a write-in winner. But will his fight with the Granite State prove costly? Plus, Governor Healy's new early education plans, including more access to pre-K programs and a focus on young readers. The state's education secretary joins me to spell out the proposals. And for years now, historian Heather Cox Richardson has been saying our democracy is in trouble. Her writing has drawn the attention of millions, including President Biden. She joins me to talk about her new book and what lies ahead. At Issue starts right now. Good Sunday morning and welcome to another edition of At Issue. I'm Corey Smith. As you can see, Sue O'Connell is off this week. We're back in the friendly confines of our Boston Media Center studios after a road trip to New Hampshire for the primary. That's where we'll start today, looking back at the results and looking forward to what comes next. As you know, former President Trump won the New Hampshire primary by a comfortable 11-point margin over Nikki Haley. 20 minutes after the polls closed, Haley spoke to supporters and put to rest any talk that she's going to drop out of the race. That left former President Trump seething. Who the hell was the imposter that went up on the stage? But I felt I should do this because I find in life you can't let people get away with bullshit. And then Donald Trump got out there and just threw a temper tantrum. <laughs> but I know that's what he does when he's insecure. I know that's what he does when he is threatened. And he should feel threatened, without a doubt. <laughs> So instead of seeking unity, the former president is going on his social media outlet and insulting Haley, calling her, quote, bird brain and saying anyone who contributes to her campaign will be, quote, permanently barred from the MAGA camp. Let's go ahead and bring in NBC 10 political reporter Matt Pritchard. Matt, it seems to me that since the polls closed in New Hampshire, Haley has decided to start going at Trump. But she continues mm -hmm. to just go after his comments and the chaos instead of his character and the content of the chaos. Has she waited too long to actually attack Donald Trump? I think a lot of people would say yes, Corey. I mean, over the months of watching her at different campaign events, you've seen her slowly but surely ratchet up the rhetoric towards the former president and, frankly, her former boss since she was his U.N. ambassador during his first term uh, as president of the United States. In the beginning, you would hear her say, I think he was the right president for the right time. Then she would move on to a line that said that chaos follows him. She agreed with his policies, but ultimately he's a chaotic person and we don't need that in the White House. And then we take our ourselves all the way to the New Hampshire primary, the week leading up a bit more, a little bit more of saying Donald Trump repeatedly has lost us elections, whether it be the White House or in Congress, the Senate or the House. But then, obviously, that night she gets up on the stage and she goes right at it. She starts talking about the senior moment. She goes after his age. She goes after the chaos that he brings yet again. And in South Carolina, we're seeing her ratchet up again, saying that he's throwing temper tantrums. So she is starting to go after the former president a bit more aggressively than we've seen. But the question really is, is it too little too late? Donald Trump has won Iowa and New Hampshire. That is a tough mountain to climb. And when you consider the fact that now she's headed to her home state of South Carolina, a state that she absolutely has to win, boy, it's hard to see how she is able to try and make her way to the GOP nomination now. But as we say, that's why we play the game. That's why we watch all these races. Perhaps we'll see a surprise come about. Well, it's clear that the former president believes he has this nomination fight sewn up, yet he continues to attack Nikki Haley. But looking ahead to the general, doesn't he ultimately need to appeal to her supporters in order to beat the Democratic nominee, especially given reports and polling out of New Hampshire that shows a large portion of Haley supporters say if it comes down to Biden versus Trump, they're not voting for Trump? Yeah, I mean, I think that's Donald Trump's biggest lift as he goes into preparing for the general election, is trying to appeal to that broader American voter. I mean, right now, we know his base is loyal to him. We've seen that again in these early voting states. But trying to get those independents, those undecideds, those moderate Republicans, and maybe some Democrats who are unhappy with Joe Biden is going to be a really tall task for the president. And I think that's what makes this particular election cycle so frustrating for so many Americans, is because they've seen both of these movies. They've seen a Donald Trump first term. They've seen a Joe Biden first term. And really, it's just a question of which presidency do you want to see a sequel of? Let's turn to the Democrats now. We saw last week the Biden campaign really sort of shift to that general election approach, not worried about Dean Phillips and his 20 percent uh, support that he got in New Hampshire. Do you expect the Biden campaign to sort of change tack and go directly 
at Donald Trump and, and, and sort of the, the chaos that he causes, the, the threat to democracy that they see him as. And, oh, by the way, they're going to tout these economic numbers as well. Yeah, I think now is the time for the Biden camp to really shift into full general election mode. I mean, they never wanted to give the Dean Phillips sort of charade in their minds a chance to have any oxygen. And I think winning in New Hampshire on a write-in campaign sort of shows that they don't have to at all. They can transition straight to Donald Trump and start taking him at on and making the case of why he should be president for another four years and why they feel that the American uh, public should not be trying to return back uh, to the presidency of Donald Trump that we saw between 2016 and 2020. Matt Pritchard joining us from home on a Sunday morning. Matt, we really appreciate you taking the time. Of course. Governor Healy's budget proposal is $56 billion. That includes about $12 billion in education funding. In that money, $475 million would go to grants to continue supporting early education providers. $38 million will be used to expand access to universal pre-K programs in 26 gateway cities, which are lower income cities with populations between 35 and 250,000. Now, the man charged with getting those dollars into the classrooms and programs across the Bay State is Massachusetts Secretary of Education Patrick Tutwiler, who is with us today. Thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Pleasure's mine. I want to start with some current events. For, for more than a year now, we've seen several teachers' unions across the Commonwealth walk out of the classroom mm -hmm. onto the picket line when contract negotiations break down. You've been a superintendent. You've been a headmaster. Mm -hmm. What is the current relationship between the Commonwealth and its teachers and teachers unions, mm -hmm. knowing that they are continuing to fight for better wages, mm -hmm. uh, health care, paid leave, things like that. Mm -hmm. So first, I think it's important to uh, articulate a core value, which is we want students in classrooms. Uh, this is a dis disruption uh, for students. It's disruption for their families. Uh, we also understand that uh, there are these really uh, pressing issues. Uh, the administration's standpoint is to work closely with both sides to get them to the table, to get to an agreement so that the, the students aren't the ones getting hit the hardest by these uh, strikes. We heard, or I heard, uh, Governor Healy on NPR last week basically echoing the same sentiments. I feel bad for the, for the kids mm -hmm. who are out of the classroom. I feel bad for the parents who are, who are now scrambling to find child care. Mm -hmm. But she didn't mention the teachers. And I look, I understand that she wants to stay neutral in this, but... When you have teachers, say, for instance, in Newton, many of them who have said, I work in Newton, but I cannot afford to live in Newton, mm -hmm. that ultimately impacts the child because that teacher has to, to drive or to take public transportation mm -hmm. early in the day, and mm -hmm. who knows how they're feeling by right. day's end. Right. What, do you, what do you tell those teachers who are saying, look, I want to be in the classroom just as much as the governor mm -hmm. wants us in the classroom, mm -hmm. but I am struggling to, to, to live my life because my wages aren't high enough or, or I need health benefits, things mm -hmm. like that. I would say that as a lifelong educator who began his career in the classroom uh, 25 years ago, I am deeply appreciative of the work that they do. I respect the work that they do, and I agree that there needs to be a wages conversation. Uh, I know that that is a local conversation and that there are fiscal constraints. Again, our push is to make sure that students get back into the classroom as soon as possible and that they get to an agreement that both sides uh, find Workable. All right, so let's go into the classroom. Uh, I want to talk about a new state commission study of students in grades K through three showing there is a literacy crisis here in mm -hmm. Massachusetts. The San Francisco based nonprofit West Ed looked at the literacy performance of nearly 35,000 students in grades K through three mm -hmm. from the 2020 school year through 2022. As you see here, more than half showed early signs of reading difficulties. Mm -hmm. Nearly 30% of students in grades K through three were at high risk of reading failure. As many as 20% showed signs of having dyslexia and needing specialized reading instruction. And low-income, ESL, special education, Latino, and black students were most likely to experience reading struggles. And about 60% of students who began the school year at risk of reading difficulties saw little to no improvement by year's end. What in Governor Healy's budget proposal will help address this crisis? I'm glad you asked. Uh, there's a significant commitment to addressing that crisis in this budget. Uh, we're calling it a literacy launch mm -hmm. uh, from age three through grade three. It's a $30 million investment in year one of a multi-year effort to address this crisis. Uh, this is a national conversation that's going on relative to early literacy. Uh, for many, many years, people who dig deep into this know that there's been a, a reading wars conversation between uh, balanced literacy, that strategy, and phonics. Uh, phonics has clearly won out. That is, with unanimity, the strategy that researchers uh, and really many educators alike say is the most effective. 
We want to see to it that every student in every classroom is learning to read with those evidence-based right. strategies. This $30 million investment is a, a step in that direction. People see that $30 million investment and say, great, good on the governor. But then they also see cuts to the Head Start program in Massachusetts, which, going back to evidence-based things that work, mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of square that circle where you launched, you know, literacy launched, but at the same time, you're having to cut Head Start programs? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a big believer in the work that uh, Head Start uh, does. As a matter of fact, my brother uh, was a Head Start uh, teacher and administrator uh, in, in Kansas. Uh, I would say we've got to look at the whole picture there. Uh, while there is a uh, small uh, reduction to the Head Start program, there are significant creases, increases to the sector. Uh, some of those increases directly impact uh, the Head Start program. So I'd say we've got to look at the whole picture uh, relative to that particular cut. On the education piece itself, do you see sort of any pushback from the legislature who ultimately has to pass this budget? The legislature, uh, you know, we will work closely with them to help them understand uh, the benefits of these investments and proposals, uh, the, the impact that it will have on students from birth uh, through college. Uh, we're looking forward to those conversations. I want to talk about BPS. There was a report that came out earlier this month saying that due to dwindling enrollment, the number of schools is practically going to be cut in half. I believe 120 schools now could go down to something like 59. Where are we with that plan, or, or what are your thoughts on this plan? Because, let's face it, dwindling enrollment is a real issue that is going to be tough to solve. So if, I, if I'm a BPS parent, how should I feel about the next coming years? Let's say I've got a, you know, a 10-year-old who's ultimately going to be aging up into these schools. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is, uh, first, uh, uh, th th there's some misinformation around what that plan is. Uh, I would say at a high level, the, the, the message in that plan is that the enrollment is dwindling. Uh, there are uh, schools that, you know, quite frankly, are not full. Uh -huh. uh, and, and old. Their and are old, old. And old. And I began my career in the Boston Public Schools. I know it well. Uh, but the district needs to be fiscally uh, smart uh, about how best to first and foremost meet the needs of their students, uh, but then also do so within the fiscal parameters uh, uh, that uh, exist in the city. And so I would say uh, continue to partner with leadership. Uh, it is a local uh, conundrum, one that we watch very closely. We care about all students, uh, but I think that they're moving in the right direction. Last week, we saw images from Logan Airport of migrant families sleeping at the airport due to the lack of shelter. Obviously, Massachusetts being a right-to-shelter state. Uh, but there's an educational part of this, too. We, we hear from, from migrant parents saying, I, I want to get my child into school as mm -hmm. soon as possible. Mm -hmm. What is being done to support those school districts that are taking on these migrant students and, and living up to that responsibility of educating yeah. young kids? I'll start with a core value, uh, and that core value of the administration is uh, every student, uh, regardless of zip code or status, deserves a high-quality education. Uh, and we're sort of putting our money where our mouth is relative to uh, the, the, the migrant uh, challenge, if you will, uh, in school districts. Right now, there are about 4,000 uh, who are attending schools across the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth has stepped up and is offering each district per student per day, $104, uh, which if they started in the beginning of the year, it's about at the same amount that uh, the per pupil expenditure is for a year. Uh, there are additional supports around technical assistance, uh, supports around um, English as a second mm -hmm. language. Uh, so we want to make sure that we do everything that we can to support uh, our school districts with meeting the needs of these students. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Secretary of Education Patrick Tutwiler, thanks for coming on. Pleasure. We appreciate time. it. We will continue this conversation as the budget process plays out. Look forward to it. All right. Still to come, a conversation and a lesson about history. Boston College history professor Heather Cox Richardson has been warning for years now that our democracy is in danger. Her new book explores how we got here. She joins us next when that issue returns. Welcome back to At Issue. Donald Trump is on pace to win the Republican Party nomination after being charged 91 times in four different criminal cases, ranging from election interference to hoarding classified materials. Not to mention, he's already been convicted in a civil fraud case or the fact that a federal jury has found him liable for sexual abuse. In other words, this is not normal. Heather Cox Richardson is a history professor at Boston College. Back in 2019, during former President Trump's first impeachment trial, she started to write a daily essay on Facebook, chronicling history as it unfolded. That turned into a daily Substack newsletter in which she examines the political news of the day through the lens of history. 
and it's the most popular political substack in America with millions of subscribers. Heather has written a book called Democracy Awakening. Now, that title may seem optimistic, but the book examines how we arrived at this moment in history with our democracy seemingly on the brink. I spoke with Heather earlier, and we started with what she wrote at the end of her book. Heather, thanks so much for joining us. I want to start our interview with where your book ends. You say, once again, we are at a time of testing. How it comes out rests, as it always has, in our own hands. It feels to me like part of the test is whether Donald Trump is reelected, because as we've seen over the last several years, he's embraced authoritarians around the world using their language and their behavior. Right now, it looks like he is moving rapidly to lock down the Republican nomination. How concerned are you that, that America might fail this democracy test? I'm concerned that the United States might reelect Donald Trump, but not because of the voters. I think in a free and fair election, there's no doubt that he would be rejected. I am much more concerned about the degree to which radical Republicans have sewn up what I call the nodes of democracy in the states that are really going to matter in 2024 for the, the Trump vote, like Florida, like Texas. And you know that there's an issue in those states because of the rate at which the people in charge of the states have removed drop boxes, for example, or have engaged in different methods of voter support. Depression. It's clear they recognize that in a free and fair vote, the Republicans wouldn't be running nearly as strongly as they are. So if, in fact, we had a, a free and fair vote in all the states in the union, I, I wouldn't be concerned at all. But where we are right now suggests to me that there's a small minority that is trying to exert its will over the rest of us. And that's deeply concerning. We hear those folks in Congress a, a lot of times referred to as sort of the enablers of Donald Trump. Is that is that an accurate, I guess, portrayal? And what role do those uh, elected officials, maybe Supreme Court justices, uh, elected judges play uh, in, in this sort of danger to democracy? Well, we have to remember that this didn't happen overnight. Trump is the outcome of 40 years of, uh, of the radical right for suppressing the vote and, and garnering additional power through gerrymandering, for example, and from uh, and a certain kind of rhetoric that they used to cement the idea that they were good Americans who were standing against those people who wanted a handout of tax dollars and had not deserved it, you know, people of color and women, for example. So he is the, the outcome of a long period of uh, this, this change in our society. Trump changed that, of course, when he was in office to turn what had been a rhetorical strategy into a movement. So the... Um, the enablers are those who had set up that argument to begin with. But then once he got into power, the idea that certain people went along with him, and I, I, I retain an extraordinary fury for the Republican senators who knew all along that they could stop him and should stop him in, for example, for his first impeachment trial, and of course in a second one as well, but quite literally said, we're not going to do this because what's really at stake is our power in the upcoming elections. So there are a number of people who should have called an end to what's going on, who still could call an end to what is going on, and who are standing back because of their own quest for power, I think, and to some degree, we know now out of fear as well. Is there, what is their benefit then? Because we, we have seen folks who stood behind President Trump, who supported him in, in his election, also be punished by President Trump for speaking out against them. I guess, is are you seeing them sort of do this sort of balancing act with I, I want to speak out on behalf of democracy, if you will, but I also want to retain power, as you said. Well, there's a lot that goes on when you encourage a strong man, for sure. And there are a number of different things, different patterns among individuals who decide to, to follow somebody like that. But there is also something going on that I think is worth calling out. And that is when Donald Trump in the present is threatening people, he's certainly complaining about those people who don't support him outside the Republican Party. But what he's really trying to do is consolidate power within the Republican Party. The threats that he made last week, for example, against Nick Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, who's running against him, the ways in which he is trying to say to Republicans, hey, you're either with me or you are. we are throwing you outside the party. You're not going to have any power going forward. That's significant. And it's significant not only because he's trying to take control of the Republican Party with all of its, um, its apparatus to elect somebody, but also because 
um, what it says about what's happening right now in the, the on the Ameri in the American Southwest and in places like Texas, where you have, I think, really quite deliberately the attempt of a minority to take over a majority, and the reality that they are not trying to include more people in their coalitions. So when Trump is actually talking about getting people to elect him, he is not trying to broaden his base. He's trying to, to make it smaller, to make it smaller and to make it more intense. And that's a really interesting thing going into the election of 2024, because if, in fact, you're running a normal American campaign, you're trying to get as many voters behind you as you possibly can. You're trying to moderate your principles. You're trying to, to bring people in who might otherwise not be enthusiastic about your candidacy. He's doing the opposite. He's basically saying even to other Republicans, hey, you're with me with my avowed attempts at authoritarianism. He has talked about for example, weaponizing the Department of Justice and weaponizing the, the Department of Defense and getting rid of our nonpartisan civil servants that we've had since 1883 and replacing them with loyalists and getting rid of freedom of the press and even getting rid of term limits. So he's, he's making it very clear what he wants. And he's saying, you either get behind me on this project or I don't want to have any part of you. So what does that say when you go forward into 2024? What is their strategy for putting him in the White House? It is not a strategy of including more people in that coalition. It seems to me it is clearly a strategy of finding a way to take that election, even though the majority of us don't want that to happen. And that's something I think we really ought to be paying attention to in the upcoming months, to watch and see where those pressure points are. And of course, right now, after what happened last week on the border of Texas, that's what I'm looking at right now to see how that's going to play out and what the intent behind it seems to be. We heard in 2016 a lot of folks who were, I guess, establishment Republicans say, we can contain him. I know he says, you know, strange things and even scary things, but we can contain him. Obviously, that was not the case moving over the course of his presidency. You're hearing less of that now, um, but I do wonder, what is the danger in, in sort of, I guess, maybe normalizing this behavior or just brushing it aside and saying, oh, he, he misspoke or he doesn't actually mean that he's just sort of playing to his audience? Well, it's hugely dangerous. And you see that in the rise of any strong man. There are always people, and they're not necessarily people of ill intent. They might be people who simply don't want the drama of extraordinary politics in their lives. You see people saying, oh, it's not going to be that bad. Oh, you're overreacting. Oh, it's not that big a deal. Oh, no, don't worry about this. We can, we can contain this. Oh, he didn't mean to say that. And that's not just happening around somebody like Trump. That happens anytime you see a strong man rise. And you, they look at people who are calling out the alarm and say, oh, you're worrying too much. It's not going to be that bad. We can control him. Well, quite literally, the people who were in Donald Trump's first administration, the adults in the room, as they called themselves, and sometimes were called by others, those ones who provided the, the guardrails are now out in front of the cameras saying he is not going to be contained. He has gotten rid of all the people who might stop him. He is talking about getting rid of, for example, those in the Department of Justice who said, now you really can't start banning everybody coming from this country, for example, or you really can't do these other things that you wanted to do. They will all be gone. So the idea that he can be contained, well, maybe you could argue that in 2016 and even in 2017, right up until the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. But this time around, even those people who were in charge of putting guardrails up around him are saying, do not delude yourselves into thinking it's not going to be bad this time, because without those guardrails, without people like us, and he's made it very clear we won't be there, you're going to be facing a dictator. And, and you know, for that matter, He's saying that. And that's what's so astonishing and so extraordinary about this moment is that there is always political spin in any American election. There are always people saying things that are maybe not quite true. There are some people making warnings that maybe are a bit over the top. In this case, it is literally the former president who is saying, this is what I'm going to do. And the truth is, he's not that strong a candidate this time around. And I think he's trying to convince people he's much stronger than he really is. As you might imagine, my conversation with Heather lasted a bit longer, and we touched on a number of other issues, including the U.S. Supreme Court and how Trump's supporters who hold elected office are now mimicking his behavior. You can watch the full interview online at NBCBoston.com slash at issue. We've also released the full interview as a special edition of Taking Issue. You can find that in the latest episode where we talk about Nikki Haley's push.
push in South Carolina and Governor Healy's budget proposal wherever you get your podcasts. And coming up next Sunday on Ad Issue, Massachusetts Senate President Karen Spilka is back to talk about a number of issues, including Governor Healy's budget proposal and the gun reform bill that senators could vote on next week. Thanks for joining us for Ad Issue on this Sunday. I'm Corey Smith. Enjoy your week.